whole trick thing. So instead of killing Joseph, put him in the dry well. <clears throat> His hope was, I would rescue Joseph, take him back to dad, and maybe daddy would love me as much as he loves Joseph. If I ever had the chance to go back to school, I would go back to get my, my doctorate in counseling. It's, it's one of the dreams, one of the life goals that I have. <coughs> and my doctoral dissertation would be called this, A Fatherless Generation. Because all of us long for the love of our daddy. Right? When I went through this spiritual retreat, I thought I had dealt with all my daddy issues. Y'all just have to realize I still have daddy issues. Because my dad was, was not kind of, he was a deadbeat dad. He was an alcoholic, my parents got divorced. But what I've realized is, this is really good, so don't miss this. All right, so if you're sleeping, wake up. <laughs> this is really good. And the first part was just okay, this is really good. We project the best of our parents onto our Heavenly Father. So when we say, God is our loving Heavenly Father, if you had a great Heavenly Father, you're like, I know exactly what that means. He's always there. He always shows up. He loves me. He gives me good gifts. He protects me. <clears throat> but here's the dangerous part. We also project the worst of our earthly father onto our heavenly father. Many years of my life, when I would hear that God is our heavenly father, I'm like, then I do not want to have a relationship with a deadbeat God. My dad didn't show up. A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Knowledge of the Whole. And he says this, the most telling thing about us is what you picture when you think of God. Let me say that again. The most telling thing about us is when you close your eyes and you picture God, what do you picture? Is it a deadbeat God? You see, when I read the story of Joseph, maybe Joseph got it right. Because he, dad, daddy loved him. Right? Gave him a coat of many colors. What about Reuben and all the other brothers? Who every time they saw Joseph, they were reminded, I'm not good enough. I wonder, did, if, 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 if you allow me to have a little, uh, be, be loose with the text. I don't think that I'm, I'm uh, violating any theological bounds, but so if you, I draw a connection. Jacob later changed to Israel. We rewind in his story. He had a dad whose name was Isaac. Isaac had a, life, a wife named Rebecca. Had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Isaac, because of the law of primogeniture, loved Esau with everything. He's the oldest. He gets the double blessing. Jacob was the younger son, so because he's the younger son, it automatically precluded him from the double blessing because of the law of primogeniture. But there's a problem. Rebecca loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau. Mom and dad, so you have a son who longs for the acceptance of his daddy. The daddy loves the firstborn. You were good enough. Sorry, you were several seconds late. So you have a dad who, because of what happened, the worst of his dad is now projected onto his sons. And Joseph and Reuben and the other 12 tribes had to live under that. Joseph actually gets into the game and settles on the plan. <laughs> Right? We're, we're going to continue in the story, but we're going to pause here for a minute. Because when I read this story, I realize what happens is so many of us, because we don't understand love, we go to one of the one of the three places that we think that we can get love. What does that mean? That means some people have an unnatural relationship with their mom or dad. And you know these people. We call them boomerang children. Right? What does a boomerang mean? You throw them out? And they just come right back. <laughs> you know what a boomerang doesn't come back with what that's called? A stick, right? So we throw our kids out and eventually they come back because there's just a kind of unnatural relationship. That wasn't a little touch, really just a little touch. 
so because of that, that's the reason why the Bible says, when you get married, you shall leave your mother and father and cling to your spouse. That's the reason why it says that. Because once you get married, your spouse's relationship needs to be just below your relationship with God. You need to honor that relationship. You read what Paul says to the church of Ephesus, that a husband shall lead his wife as Christ led the church. Right? So we go to a family relationship. We go to, to brotherly or friendships. Right? And this is what happens. When, when, when we look at, we're longing for a love and acceptance from our Heavenly Father. When we go to our parents, guess what? If you have a deadbeat parent, you project the words of that on God. You don't have a relationship with God. Even if you have really, really good parents, guess what? There's times when they drive you crazy, amen? At least I did. Right? I love my mom. Right? I, 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 would, I would run you over. I would knock you out. You talk about my mom. But there were times I remember telling I hate you. <laughs> Why? Because I want to go out with my friends. No, your grandma. I hate you. <laughs> now, I really love you, but I hate you. Right? So, story and relationship falls short. So, we go to our friendships. Right? We put ourselves in the friendships. Guess what? I have friends who stabbed me in the back. <clears throat> so, you look at it and you go, okay, my, my dad let me down. I have friendships who have let me down. Okay? So, there's this arrows. If you've noticed the word arrows, E-R-O, are the first three letters also in the word erotic. So what happens is we go after this passionate relationship. Many times they become sexual relationships. And we throw ourselves into these sexual relationships. And guess what? It never satisfies. I can, at some point, if you want to hear about the skeletons in my closet, we'll sit down and we'll talk about the mistakes I've made in every one of these. The word eros, it's this deep, passionate love. If you dig down into the word eros, it is, it is heat. It is, this, it is this burning sensation. Now listen, which is good within the context of a marriage relationship. I've said this time and time again. Within the context of a marriage relationship, when you have the fire ring, have lots of eros. Continue to woo your spouse, to chase after them, to pursue them, to, to, to go on dates, to have this romantic type of love. But what happens is because we don't have these marriage relationships, we have the same kind of arrows, this deep, passionate love, this, this wildfire. And what happens if you dig deep enough, there's a word called immolation. I'll spell it for you. I-M-M-O-L-A-T-I-O-N. Immolation. I looked it up, and it was, it was what was just told me. It is the act of immolating. I'm like, thank you, Websters. <laughs> That's not very helpful. And so you work on the word immolate. It means... To give a sacrifice. But not just a sacrifice. It is a burnt offering. Let's connect it out to you. Ready? Many of us have chased after a relationship. Where God wants the best for us and wants nothing from us. And we chase after it in sexual relationships. And we've been burned alive. And we walk around with these scars. And what happens is, if you ever see a burn victim, they look in the mirror and they go, how could anyone ever love me? What's great about this spiritual retreat that I went through is because that was the breakthrough that I had. I've got it in my head. For many years, I have it in my head. I could understand and project it very eloquently. And what I needed was to travel that 12 inches to my heart. And I realized in my life, I've chased after it and in a career as a pastor. Because I thought if I could be the best pastor that I could be, right? If I could lead souls to the Lord, if I could lead baptisms, if, the, if it's a growing church, well, maybe God would love me. Why? Because that's how it was for my dad. If it was a football game, dad would show up. If it was Tuesday afternoon, dad probably wasn't there. Why? Because it was Tuesday. So if I could work long enough and hard enough that somebody would deserve to love me, that's what God would do. Guess what that leads to? Right? Because you never, listen, you ready for this? You're never good enough. 
You're never going to work hard enough. You're never going to witness enough. You're never going to pray enough. You're never going to read enough. Why? Because he's perfect. And newsflash, you're not. And it, it, it crushed me when I had to sit across the table from somebody. And they're like, Ben, do you think that you deserve a relationship? Yes! Yeah. If anybody, if anybody deserves a relationship with God, it's this guy. He must be somebody important. It killed me. It killed me. I finally realized that I had to go and apologize to my wife. It's pretty humbling. Because I haven't been the best husband that I could be. I've went and I've uh, apologized to my boys. Because I know that I haven't been the baddest dad that I could be. And I finally come to the realization that God loves me not because of who I am. When I read the story of Joseph, the sins of the father goes to the third and to the fourth generation. All the 12 tribes of Israel were, were, were messed up. Not because of their dad, but because of their grandpa. Make that connection. Because Isaac wasn't able to love his son the way that he was supposed to. <coughs> time, like I told Amanda, I have a land of plane. It's kind of how I, I think. I kind of go to the pre flight checklist. I kind of get to the cruising altitude and kind of land the plane. And I said, I don't know how to land the plane. Other than this, so Sherry, I'd love for you to come and say <coughs> something. But I bet that uh, if you're here today, you, you, you probably experienced some of this. Uh, that you've had a parent that <coughs> hasn't loved you to the best of their ability. And so it's damaged your relationship with your Heavenly Father. I'm sure if you're here today, if you're like me, you've given in to some Eros type love. And you've had some relationships that are sexual in nature, romantic in nature, that's not with your loved one, your spouse. And there's this guilt and shame that's uh, attached to it, so you feel guilty that you have a shame and become a vicious cycle. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, like, I know that I, I, I throw it myself into my, my friendships. Because maybe my friends can love me more and I can gain love and acceptance from them. And other than having a relationship with God and, and, and being able to experience all that he loves, has for you, all, all the love that he has for you. Now think about this, all he wants to do is love on you. Because his love is a perfect love, all he wants for you is, is his love and his grace and his hope and his kindness, and his joy and his peace. He wants to give you self-control. So here, here, here's the altar call. Around the room, I've talked to several of you, so if I talk to you, would you go and kind of stand around the room? Maybe you're thinking, you just you really just need to, to have this moment to pray with somebody and to have a breakthrough to experience. It's a godly type of love.